Hey, welcome back, everybody. Time once again for another episode of Health Talks with Dr. Trin. The one show, the only show that tells you about, well, a healthier life, healthier brains, healthier living. And today, well, we've got a very healthy debate or discussion in mind with our returning guest, Dr. Grove, here to talk about education and how it reflects us. Dr. Grove, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate your inviting me back. That's very nice. Dr. Trin, why did you bring him back? We just had this guy here two weeks ago. <laughs> a little more than two weeks. Or whatever. It was. Recently. Wasn't that oh, long ago. We had him back. Yeah. We had just a... Uh a stimulating discussion that uh, that one hour was definitely not enough to uh, to to address what we wanted to address and talk about uh, what we want to talk about. And, and if you recall, the last time we were here, we talked about uh, why the the Asian Americans uh, students um, excel academically over other groups. And uh, was it because they are just naturally smarter or was it because they worked harder? And, uh, and I think uh, Dr. Grove had a resounding answer that we, you know, we're no smarter than anyone else. <laughs> but driven to success, it's a cultural imperative within the Asian community here. As you said, Dr. Trin, if you get an A minus, that's an Asian F. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And is that a good thing or a bad thing, Dr. Yeah. Grove? Right. And, <laughs> I don't know if he wants to go into good or bad here, but I'll let him tackle that here. He's just well, observing what he sees, I think. Yeah. Well, good or bad is in the eyes of the beholder. It depends what what your value system is. And mm -hmm. in my most recent book, which looks at uh, preschool and primary schooling in East Asia, East Asia being China, Japan. Hong Kong, Taiwan, and ideally Korea, but very little research has been done in Korea, so it really doesn't get mentioned in, in my book. The book we're talking about is A Mirror for Americans. Mm. It was published last year by Roman and Littlefield. And uh, yes, to pick up on what you were talking about, um, I was looking at at what goes on in China, Japan, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, which has been extensively documented uh, over 50 years. But when immigrants come from those places into the United States, I think many people will recognize that very often, even though some of them come into schools with very little English, that they are amazingly rapidly at the head of the class. Um, so what they're bringing with them is not a smarter brain. A lot of effort has been made to show that they have a smarter brain. Every one of those efforts has collapsed. It just, there's right. absolutely nothing to it. What they bring, it's good to say that if they, a willingness to learn to uh, work hard, but the real story is what is really important to them what is their highest value as a family. And in East Asian families, again, we're generalizing, this won't be true of every single family in East Asia, but, and in Asia generally, I believe, mm -hmm. academic excellence, academic mastery, and the hard work to attain that mastery is deeply admired and desired. Yes. And there basically you have the whole story. So, so let's see if I can frame this in some terms for our audience this morning, because I really want to get them more involved in this. You know, we, we as a society love to attack our educational system. Every politician, every business leader, every mom at the local PTA meeting starts with the assumption that there's something wrong with our educational system. Uh, and we've tried through the years uh, the last big overhaul that I can remember was under George Bush when they had this, uh, you know, uh, drive to uh, standardize, to test, to, to 
kids were, it was like the old missile gap that I grew up with in the 50s and 60s. We're falling behind the Russians. We're falling behind the Asians. So we've got to test, 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 and we've got to standardize curriculum, and we've got to drive better results. Uh, we can't just uh, play around in these schools anymore. We got to get serious. We got to drive our kids. We got to uh, right. vis a vis the, the rest of the world. We've got to score higher. Now, even with all that determination and testing, all that did is just create more. Well, you're just teaching to the test. Uh, it's not really learning, it's just rote memorization. What about creativity? What about uh, inspiration? you know, blah, 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 Esteem. all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, so we're constantly saying there's something wrong. And yet Dr. Grove says, look, look in the mirror. What's if you think it's wrong, it's just a reflection of what you want to see what you want to do is education really the priority is scoring high on tests, uh, getting A's really the number one priority for most American parents. I'm not sure it is. Of course, it is for a few families, and let's let's leave aside that it certainly is for many immigrant families. Yeah, uh, but we're we're dealing in large generalizations here, and it's been recognized for a long time by anthropologists and sociologists who look at American culture and educators and so forth that hey, nobody here is saying so at least that me nobody's saying education is not important. But in relation to other important things, it's in the middle someplace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I'll give you some examples of that. So we talked about last time. I mean, I raised a daughter here in South Orange County, which is an affluent upscale community. A much higher percentage of kids go to college. It's just expected. Everybody's going to go to college. My daughter did not. But the vast majority of kids, Dr. Trin said, hey, it's just assumed you're all going to go to college. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, 12th grade isn't the end of the educational system for many, particularly in the middle or upper middle class or upper classes of society or in immigrant societies. That being said, I can recall, this is just anecdotal, but boy, if your kid like my daughter was on the varsity basketball team, that was a big deal. And I bragged about it all the time. If yeah. my kid got straight A's, that's nice. <laughs> but I wasn't running around telling the whole world, hey, my kid got straight A's. Uh, somehow I was more excited as a parent to see them, uh, the well-rounded education, the more than just the bookworm, the idea that they're a, an athlete or an actor or a rap star or something. I don't know. There's so many other things that we seem to, we uh, say we want education, but boy, the parents get real excited and real involved in these other activities and not so excited or involved in school. Why? Well, this is, this is really the fundamental story that I'm trying to tell. Unfortunately, there is not an easy fix to this. No. But at least... Because if it's I, a problem, it's within us that we're not right. We're saying, what's wrong with the school system? And the yeah. school system should hold up a mirror and say, we're yeah. reflecting what you think is important. And I think Dr. Trin will, uh, will bear me out that um, in Asia in general, and certainly in East Asia, uh, some people refer to it, the, the, the philosophy or the, um, the ways of life there and the way of thinking about learning and education it's sometimes called Confucian. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. there was, of course, a sage uh, named Confucius. He yes. almost was a contemporary of Socrates, who was, in, of course, in another part of the world at that time. Hmm. Um, and this uh, importance of education, this terrific importance of academic learning, or what some people would derisively call book learning, is sometimes attributed to Confucius. And he certainly had a role to play, but he was not the originator of this. Mm. Confuci Confucius took thought and ideas and values that were current in his time, and he, he came to embody them during his life and became extremely well known in his own time as well as in sub subsequent times right down until today when we're still talking about him. Um, 
you know, the, the importance of, of learning to mastery whatever is important. In their day, it wasn't math or, or uh, science. In their day, it was something else. It was the classics, the, the old, even older writings, older than Confucius, that were thought to make somebody a highly educated person. Or in, or, and, in, um, uh, or in Western terms, our, you know, our forefathers used to study Greek and they would yeah. study Aristotle and Plato and they uh, would, it would, and it they would, would memorize the Aeneid uh, from Virgil and things like I have that. The, I have the feeling, and it's maybe just my perception, that, that every year we uh, in government uh, devote more dollars toward the education system. Um, are we seeing the results of that, Dr. Grove? Well, that's, you know, a, that's there's a loaded old, question. Yeah, what results are you looking for? Are you getting you know, there's, you, Yeah. There's an old saying, uh, a definition of frustration. <laughs> frustration uh, is when you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Yeah, madness. Yes. A and... Uh, I believe that's a good characterization because when we engage in all these reforms and, uh, and throwing money at things and making new rules and, and laws and so forth, we're not really addressing the fundamental problem, which mm -hmm. is our highly individualistic culture. Yes. And Find highly yourself. individualistic cultures aren't highly conducive to learning to mastery in classroom. The kind of cultures that exist in many other parts of the world, not only Asia and particularly East Asia, which is the part that I know about, right. um, but in many other cultures, um, the, there's much less emphasis on the individual and everything that goes with that and much more emphasis on the collective or the community. Sometimes these cultures are called group oriented. Sometimes they're called collectivist. Sometimes they're called communitarian. I like communitarian. That's the that's yeah. the word I like. And these are well, the greater good is outweighs your own individual absolutely. desires. Right? And and one of the interesting things I think that I learned doing these books and is certainly written about in them and in particular in the drive to learn the one about how the children are raised at home, which is really a book about their culture, hmm. Hmm. Um, is that the researchers have found, I don't know how to put this, I think it will be shocking to some people that, that what an individual child wants really doesn't have very much, doesn't count for very much because it's what the family wants. Yeah. What the family wants is what the family members want. Mm -hmm. um, so true. It doesn't, yes, it doesn't necessarily mean that an individual member can't speak up and express an opinion. I, I don't think that's true, but it means that one way or another, what they want is what I want. And as a matter of fact, you may be aware that one of the thing, one of the thing that psychologists like to talk about, educational psychologists, is the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic trinsic, uh, motivation. <clears throat> that from me. within or that from without? What what springs yeah. up within you? So your own well here, here in our culture, desires? being a, yeah. here in our culture, being an individualistic culture, um, research has found that when children uh, choose what they want to do, let's say with uh, a classroom project of some kind or a term paper, what do they want to write about? There are many ways that this might apply. When they choose, when they make a choice and follow through on that choice, they're more likely to be successful and satisfied, you know, mm -hmm. that the right things have happened. <laughs> so, so that's a support they, they of the, what the it, teacher tells them to do or what the mother or father tells them to do that that doesn't rank as high on the satisfaction and success measure. 
All right, so let's see if we can turn this into some tangents here. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same in Asia. The, the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic collapses in East Asia. There yeah. really isn't a difference between what I want yeah. and what the fa family wants. So it's very interesting because I, I know in our culture, we emphasize, you know, follow your dreams, follow your passion, you know, your individual dreams, your individual passion. I'm not sure that exists in Asia where you follow your dreams and you follow your passion. It's more like what's good for the family. Mm -hmm. It's a very, you, you pointed out something that's very interesting. And, uh, and so does it mean, does it mean that if you're individualistic where you're following your dream and you're following your passion, does that mean that the value of education just falls off somewhere? No, because, because your dream and your passion may require a great deal of education. You yourself, yeah. I mean, medical school and residency and all of that is a big deal. So it doesn't necessarily rule out education. Right, right. But you're absolutely right. We, if I can imagine an, an Asian family, you know, Vietnam, China, Korea, Taiwan, um, it's, more a, it's more of a family decision on uh, on activities as opposed to the, to an individual decision on on yeah. life decisions so let me sure. give you another example so we did a show a couple of years ago on um it was a, it was it was kind of a, a real niche program put on by a group that does um counseling or um uh, uh, not counseling but sort of coaching guidance whatever you call it to uh, you know helping kids learn and everything and they focused on immigrant kids mostly, um, uh, mostly Chinese. Uh, they, were in, they were in Orange County, large population of Chinese people who still live in China, but send their kids to the United States starting in high school, hoping they'll get into an American university because their perception is uh -huh. Stanford, Harvard, UCLA, whatever, UCI even, uh, right. that these are better institutions than they have over there. Now, a funny thing happened, they admitted, a lot of these kids don't want to go home because once they've been exposed to the American way of individual thinking, what do I want? Who do I want to be? Nobody ever asked me that question before. Here's what I scored good at. Here's what I was told. Here's where my parents pushed me. Here's where the state pushed me. Here's where the school system pushed me. I guess that's what I'm supposed to be. And suddenly these kids are waking up saying, maybe I don't want to be a doctor. Maybe I want to be a ballet <laughs> or whatever or something you know yeah, right. something very uh creative or individualistic and in, in a weird way they send them here to get the benefit of what they perceive to be right. better education but in the sense they get they get westernized uh, westernized <laughs> i was gonna try and say it in other ways they get corrupted by our american system here and it's hard for them to go home and fall back into yeah. the uh communitarian view here um, I believe that one reason they send their kids here is so that they'll become thoroughly able to, to do everything in English. Yes. And, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the funny thing, I, I've been in this field for many years and my original field was international education. And among international educators, there was a saying, this goes back a number of decades, um, I used to say worldwide, it was understood by a lot of people that the best education in the world was to send your child to elementary and secondary school any place but the United States <laughs> and send them to college in the United States. Yes. And yeah. that's the best education because in elementary and secondary, and my book, A Mirror for Americans, is most, mostly about elementary and why they do so well in the way they teach their lessons. And we can talk about that. Yeah. Um, whereas in the United States, there's, you know, lessons get taught and some things get learned, but the real emphasis is on individualism and sports and clubs and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and being a well rounded. Person. I was in that too. I did that <laughs> a long time ago. All right. Um, but Ameri but when kids in many cultures abroad go to college, they're right. really kind of coasting at that point. Getting into college is the big deal. Right. Yes. 
and you have a terrific education by the time you get into college. And then in it, college is a little bit of a coast. But colleges are really good in the United States. They really teach something. Well, so let me that's... bring up one other point that I think this is true. You can verify if it is. In many parts of the world, particularly Asia, uh, or even in England and other places like that, getting into college isn't automatic. There is this all-important entrance exam. We take an SAT that just sort of says which college you can go to, but it doesn't say whether you can go to college. I can right. go to college anywhere. There's a billion colleges from little ones and local ones and community colleges up to Harvard. If um, your money is green, you can get into a college. You can get into a college. But <laughs> there, in many of these places, if you don't score well, then your path is suddenly different. You're in a technical school. You're in a trade school. You're in something else. Yeah. You don't, only the best are allowed to go on, not everybody. And so it puts this huge pressure to pass that exam. Talk about that exam in Asian culture. I think they do it in England yeah. and other places too, but. Well, I, I, in one of my books, I don't remember which one it is. Um, I say, look, you know, for an American child, for an American junior or senior in high school to get into college, what, what, what can they put forward to represent themselves to persuade the admissions people to select them? Well, first of all, it's their grades. Right. And then it's the SAT or the ACT, which of course these things are in the process now of getting, getting de-emphasized and phased out. Right. Um, there are letters of recommendation from teachers. There are letters of recommendations from other important people there are summer jobs and of course some of these and internships and of course some of these kids uh, go and get really extraordinary things to do in foreign countries and to help save the, you know, the sick and the- Dr. Tringer, some there. of them is tongue out uh, clubs at these high schools and colleges yeah. where these kids are trying yeah. to go to uh, Haiti or Vietnam and yeah. help yeah. vaccinate or kids and, and stuff. And then in addition, you know, your parent, one of your parents might have gone to that university. And uh, so some, some universities uh, uh, let, let uh, in, uh, give preference to students of, of alumni. Oh, I forgot to mention the, the essay. The, the, the essay. When did this the college write? essay. I never had uh, to write a college essay in the 70s to go to college. It was just an SAT uh, and a grade uh, thing. And, um, and then even more than the legacy admissions, if your parents went there, what if your parents is a big donor? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're an Asian junior or senior and you want to go to college, there's only one thing you can do is ace the big test. Yeah. Which in China wow. is called the Gao Kao. Gao Kao. That's it. Talk about you the know, test. What? How long is it? What? How tough is it? How many kids pass or fail? Uh, I don't have that information in front of me. It's a fearsome thing, no doubt. But see, this is within this is within the the cultural experience of Asia. I think probably both of you know, and I'm confident that Dr. Trend knows mm -hmm. that there was a an examination in China which lasted over a thousand years. I think believe it lasted exactly. 1300 yep. years wow. it only was discontinued in the early 1900s and that exam uh determined who became a senior government administrator and that was the only thing and i do know a little bit about that because the people have written about it and people you know i you got kids now that fear these tests and they want extra time because they're I don't know, they have some problem that they have and so forth. In this case, what you did was, first of all, you studied for years with a tutor. And then on the day of the exam, you went to the exam location and you took with you uh, some food, some water, a chamber pot, maybe, uh, maybe a little bedding, mm. and you were you were put into a room with the exam questions and mm. three days later you exited and handed in your paper and uh, they passed the rate of people who made a terrific score was something like one percent or two percent wow now that's a serious exam uh we don't have anything to even remotely compare to that but 
this was a standard thing every, I guess it was every year. I can't actually say that it was an annual thing in China. Um, some, some people in the West thought that this was a really good idea. You want the best and the brightest to be running the country. So you give a really difficult exam and that's the main way, or maybe the only way that you choose. Them. I'm going to be a typical American <coughs> who, like Dr. Trin was successful in college and went to good universities and all this stuff. I find that abhorrent. I don't know how our audience does. What a <laughs> stress. What a, what kids must kill themselves or get sick or whatever or something. If they don't pass, they're ruined their whole life. One test. Yeah, well, the individual is more than a test. It's who they are and, and, and their individual gifts and their individual contributions. I'm all about yeah. finding them, not just, not just grading them and testing them. I, I don't know. Yeah. God forbid their low self-esteem if you don't get the top Yeah, score. your life is ruined. Uh, <laughs> you know. Now, having said that, what we pointed out the last time is I'll give you the flip side of it. The other value that we put, at least us American dads, is sports. Oh, my God, if your kid shows any ability, get him into sports. And by God, we're there every week at the sideline and we're coaching them and we're buying tutors and we're pushing them and we're bragging to our buddies and we're fighting in the stands because our kid did this and did that now. And I and just want to jump in here. But not only that, mm -hmm. but we expect the kid to uh, whatever sport it is, football, hockey, whatever. We expect them to practice, 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 practice. work at it again and again. Take right. the advice of the coach. Uh, you know, and, get. And if you sport. don't like it, tough bananas. And yeah. if you and if you and get you weak, you're out. be exactly. tough. Pick yourself up. Get back out there again. I don't so, care if you were shamed and humiliated. If you you know work harder to make the cut, um, yeah. do it better the next time. It's 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 driving them the same way Asian yeah. parents drive kids in scholastics. We drive our kids in sports. That's right. And they really don't care all that much about sports. And they sometimes don't even allow their kids to do sports because it detracts from their studying. So it's almost a mirror image, the kind of effort that many American families put into their kids' sports is comparable in many ways to the kind of effort that East Asian parents exactly. put into their kids' learning. Like, well, are like, we surprised then that they do better than us in these tests? That okay. really sheds a light, guys, because I've never did the sports analogy. I mean, my son, you know, he, Jonathan was in NJB basketball and both our kids were uh, in track and cross country and things of that sort. But, uh, but that analogy is amazing because most of us have not thought about that. The, the effort we put into sports, whether it's dancing or gymnastics and, and the money we put into it and the coaching and the extra hours. I remember my daughter spending hours every day on whether she was doing gymnastics or dancing. It was several days a week. Yeah. It was full time for us. Not yes. just full time for her. It was full time for us because we were there the whole time driving her off, you know, dropping her off, picking her up. But, yeah. the, you know, 16 hours a week on whether it's gymnastics or, or dance was the effort we put in for sports. But but you guys are right. It's the same effort that the Asian community put in, except it's the, those resources went from sports to actually math and English, wow. and all the yeah. all science. Yeah. Other, other stuff, right? You guys are right. And think about this. It's not just the effort and the money. That's a big deal. It's, it's how you did it. In sports, there was no complaining. You practice, practice, practice. Um, there was a cut of, of various stages. They kept pruning the teams as you went up from NJB National Junior Basketball to uh, high school to other things. And you kept having to make the prove yourself and make the grade and kids got cut and they were hurt and they were disappointed and the parents were disappointed and they fought like hell to try and get through that test, through that examination, through that trial by fire. But when, in, when it came to it, there was no whining, there was no complaining. You get in there and you work your butt off. Yeah. But when it comes to school, well, okay, you tried as long as you gave it your best. Yeah. At least finish your homework. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are absolutely right. What a light bulb moment for me to so realize. I, I want to, I don't know, I know we're on Zoom here, uh, yeah. but when, you're, when your listeners finally 
hear this. Is it on Zoom? Are we visible? Yes, we're visible now. We're on Facebook Live and YouTube. Oh, so so it would be visible. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, so and it's a podcast, and you can hear it too. So yeah. So here here is the um, cover right. of my book, The Drive to Learn. And this is important, and I bring it now because it's it's related to what we're talking about. Yeah. I think if you look at this, you'll see that we have presumably a mother and a child. They have a workbook in front of them down yeah. here. They both have pencils in their hand, and you can tell that they're in a kitchen mm. because you have the stove behind them. Right. Yeah. I'd like to tell you the story behind this photograph. Okay. Okay. In directly in line with what you're talking about, there's another little, there's another important aspect to this. And that is that once, once a child in, in, in uh, the United States gets involved in sports, uh, usually the parent isn't fully able to really help to train and coach the child in that court in that sport. They give them a lot of support. They cheer them on. Uh, they listen to them. They, you know, they throw money at it to get equipment and everything. But um, so, but when you come to East Asia and you're thinking about how parents deal with their, with their children's learning of academic topics, they're the parents uh, because they've been through school and presumably have done very well in school themselves they're better able to help the child and to support the child. And so what happens is that in East Asia, the, I, I like an American, American parents uh, thinking about their kids studying are a little bit more like cheerleaders. They're, they're monitoring, they're making sure the homework gets done. They're making sure the kid has, you know, a quiet time at the kitchen table to complete it or, or whatever. But in right. East Asia, the parent is much more like a, an athletic coach or an athletic trainer. They do the work with the child. In some cases, it's well known that Asian parents will go out and buy the textbooks and they'll learn and they'll read along in their own copy of the textbook so that they can discuss and work with the child on whatever the topic is. And right. another thing they do, which is, uh, which is illustrated here, is that they'll go out and buy commercial workbooks. Now, wow. when the parent and the child sit down to work together on learning, it's a serious thing. They are really talking about the learning. They are figuring out how do you divide this, whatever it is, whatever it is. So in, I, wanted a, I wanted a photograph on the cover of this book to show that in action. And I think both of you might be aware that there are there are a number of large businesses in the United States and actually around the world that have nothing but photographs. Yeah, stock photo shops. Yeah, yeah stock about. photo. And you go into their shops and I said, okay, so I'm gonna go into the stock photo shop and I'm gonna find a, a picture of an American, you know, some parents uh, working very hard and supporting uh, them and sitting side by side with their child and doing something academic. Well. You can find pictures with children learning, I mean, with parents and children learning, either with something to read or more often with a computer. But right. it is always fun. That's the they key. are always laughing and smiling. Okay. It is having a good time. This is wow. not the way this is thought of in Asia. Let's this is serious about business. Now, to get to this, you know how I got this picture? No. How? I hired a photographer and two models, and <laughs> we took it. this picture. It cost me $2,000 <laughs> to get this picture. That's because there was no stock photo that showed parents and children working hard and seriously at academic learning. So let's pursue that. And then I know Dr. Trin wants to jump in here. That's the key. That's where I want to pivot. That's what you brought up last time. That's what you just brought up again. When it comes to education, there are two views. It's either the sports analogy of learning 
This mm -hmm. isn't about fun. Go out and run the track and right. do it a hundred times and practice a hundred more. That's not fun, but it's what's necessary to achieve. Exactly. So it's not about how much fun it's about how much you achieve, how much you can do. When it comes to school learning for most Americans, it's about fun. It's about entertaining. It's about holding their attention. It's yeah. not about forcing them to do everything. It's not about rote memorization anymore. It's not about drills. We used to get drilled with flashcards and all sorts of other stuff. That's not fun. Uh, so somewhere along the way, we decided school had to be fun. Sports doesn't have to be fun. Music doesn't have to be fun. Dancing doesn't have to be fun. It's about hard work and practice and repetition and memorization. Mastery. And if you fall, get up, dust yourself off and keep going. But in yeah. school, the minute it's not fun, it doesn't hold my attention, I'm not entertained, I'm bored, I've got mm -hmm. uh, ADD, I've got two-second attention spans. The whole right. world's got a two-second attention yeah. span when it comes to school. So, where, um, so then why are we surprised that we are turning out entertainers more than we're turning out educators? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a, it's a very big, very fundamental difference in deep values. Yeah. What do you think, Dr. Trend? Is school supposed to be fun? And is sports or dance or other things supposed to be fun? So here's the other thing that just came to mind. Um, and this goes back to, uh, to our culture of, uh, of individualism versus community, right? Communitarian uh, with that. Like, for example, in many uh, friends and family that that we know, if your son or daughter got a B or a C, you know, uh, it's on them, right? They're they're uh, it's on them. It's their fault, and uh, they should do better next time. In many Asian cultures, if your son or daughter got a, a B or a C, it's on the parents. Yeah, that's right. And so, so I'm starting to see now this this cultural mindset where where my child's success is a reflection of who I am as a parent. Uh, my child's success is a reflection of of how I did, and so I am responsible as much as my child is responsible for that grade. Yeah. That's not an American mindset. No. Because it's an individualistic it. culture and the child is an individual. It is when it comes to sports, though, because I lived and died <laughs> yeah. through my daughter's basketball success. I was lousy at basketball, even though I'm six foot four. So I put her into basketball to vicariously live what I couldn't do. And she achieved what I didn't do. She for, for old dad, she took it out there every week and fought. And I mean, I think she liked it. I knew she liked it. It gave her something. I'm not going to say it was all selfish on my part. She really okay. did take to it. She really was good at it. But a lot of it, I cheered her on. I accepted her failings in, in academic. I, dis, I, I came up with excuses. I said, well, it's not for her. She's not this. But I did not accept anything but perfection when it came to sports. And she achieved it. And is it any wonder she barely graduated from high school? She struggled to do that. Um, and yet she was an excellent athlete. Wow. Yep. It was a reflection of me. I I didn't live. If she had been a straight A student, I wouldn't wouldn't have lived through that. I was yeah. a straight A student, um, but I wasn't an athlete and I lived vicariously through that experience. So that I prioritize. So let me give you one more uh, bomb thrower here. I'll be one more little bomb thing that I've always observed. And we've had a couple people on other shows talk, touch on this. And this is really culturally explosive stuff. I don't want to offend anybody. But here in America, there isn't just one American culture. We're kind of talking about the typical middle class yeah. suburban values that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, there are other ethnic groups. Uh, and we'll talk about Hispanic. I happen to know something about that because my daughter is adopted and she came from Mexico, horrible life, abused, fell into foster care here, East LA, a poor area. We found her in our mind. We somehow rescued her. She rescued us. And then we brought her into this, you know, culture 
And she, at 11, when we found her, she couldn't read or write in any language, Spanish, English, or anything. Wow. School was some, because she was moved around in Mexico, she never went to school. Let's start with that. She just worked in the fields. So by the time she came to America and was being passed around in foster homes, one after the other, they just moved her on rather than try and flunk her. They didn't know what to do with her. She was a wild child raised by wolves in their mind. She had no, she couldn't read or write in any language. She couldn't add two and two and she's 10. Wow. Um, she had, edu nobody taught her anything. So here's my point. As I've watched this now, and, and she married a young Hispanic man, uh, and, and he comes from, you know, humble background here in Santa Ana and other thing. His parents are immigrants that don't speak the language well and all this stuff that we talk about. When I look at their household and many of these Hispanic households, not only isn't there a priority to, to learn because none of these people have been through school, have any educational background, um, but, and they don't have the as same aspiration that uh, Asians do. Well, my kids can be a doctor, a lawyer, whatever here. There's also an environment, a physical environment too many people packed in too small a space. There is no place for these kids to study. There mm -hmm. is no quiet kitchen table where you can take them aside. Or when I was in my own room where I had my own desk and where I was locked away, go upstairs and do your homework and don't come down till it's done. Mm -hmm. um, there is no, they're in front of the TV and there's an iPad in one hand and a phone in the other and everybody walking through. And I think you can't learn in that kind of environment, even if you want to. So talk, and we had somebody on a while ago was talking about, uh, 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 I think it was Cal State, um, uh, the one in San Diego, the one in North San Diego County, um, whose name is Casey, one of the Cal State systems. And he was there to help minority kids. And he said, the problem isn't just desire. There's a physical environment, environment that prohibits right. them from learning. Too many people, too small a space, too loud, too chaotic, too many other temptations, noise, TV, and these kids never can focus. What do you think about that? Is that a cultural, another cultural layer problem on it here? You get too many people living in too small a space and they well, don't have the, the, the physical space to learn? Uh, being a communitarian culture, Chinese and Japanese culture also is capable of um, having more than just a, un a nuclear family in a small space. Yeah, there's but grandma and grandpa and the uncles and everybody else there. Yeah. Um, but what I'd like to emphasize is, I mean, I, I believe that the main point is that when an extended family and the parents and an extended family are deeply, you know, their, their, their sense of their own virtue depends on excellent academic learning in school from books and those sorts of things. And I don't, and that, that has a deep, deep history in, in East Asia that goes back even farther than, um, Confucius. than uh, Confucius, uh, that goes back farther than, than those uh, terrible exams that we were discussing a little while ago. It's, it's, just a very, very deeply seated, deeply important aspect of the culture. I don't think that is true of the kind of culture you were describing. I'm not uh, saying that they have no, remember, uh, <laughs> we're not saying that other, other people, whether it's Americans or Hispanics, we're not saying, oh, they don't care at all about education. That's nonsense. We're not well, saying that. clearly but, want the kids to learn, but-, but you know, there are levels with which you can care about something. And in East Asia, it's at the highest level. Right. In American like, culture and in Hispanic culture and in some other cultures. This I, is African American kids, they complain all the time, you know, that the how do I teach these kids when at home it's chaos? Yeah. And, it's and it's true. It's true. Un, there un, are, un, there is chaos. Yeah. But I, you know, there's no way we can, uh, I don't think anybody would be able to do research on this. Uh, I don't know. I have to think it's very interesting but uh, I, I would I would like to think as all the years I've spent spent as an interculturalist and an anth and somebody who's deeply interested in anthropology and all the many many things I've read about this I would like to think that if you had that kind of deep-seated historically 
imperative feeling about the importance of academic learning that even in that kind of household, they would figure out a way for that student to be able to study. Right. But they don't, just like us Americans, they don't have that kind of imperative to it. It is not part of their definition of self-virtue. No. And so they don't have the deep motivation to try to ensure that the child can learn extremely well. Um, it's a matter of what is deeply important to you. That I think is the fundamental thing I'm trying to get across. Uh, we have other, I mean, talking about ethnic groups, uh, I, 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 I spent some time as an adjunct uh, lecturer at the New School for Social Research, or now the New School University here in New York, and I had a couple of graduate classes. This is about 20 years ago, and um, I eventually just quit, and the reason I quit is because the American students really weren't interested in learning. I had I had students come to me, American students come to me at the end of the course, and I'd given a C. Well, that's pretty rough in uh, university. <laughs> they don't usually give C's or maybe a B minus or something. And they'd say, oh, Dr. Grove, can't you just raise my grade a little bit? Because if 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 I if I don't have a grade higher than this, my employer isn't going to pay my tuition. And I said, well, whose fault is this? It's not my fault. <laughs> Uh, but I did have, uh, but I always say the Americans weren't any good, but I, there were two groups in my class that studied hard and really made me proud. And I, and I love them, but they were very much in the minority. And those people were immigrants and Jews. Wow. Wow. And, and they both, were all immigrants and Jews. And both of those, again, I, I know it's, it's dangerous to make cultural assumptions about groups of people. You yeah, know, that's we, Americans have gotten in trouble for way too long, and we're trying to get away from a lot of that. But my perception, I think many per people's perception, is that among Asian populations and Jewish populations, yeah. education is a expectation and a priority, a deep priority. And when you look at uh, middle class, regular Americans, and other uh, uh, lower class, uh, you know, a, a poor people, many of which. Hispanic, African American, other groups, and I say, why are these people mired in poverty? Why can't we get past this? Because they don't have the same expectation of pride. Now, this is bomb throwing stuff. I, I'm not saying they don't want their kids to succeed and be great, but but and it we is. We need to say that there are examples, very excellent examples. I'm not sure I can rattle off names. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, I wasn't prepared for this. Of of children who've come out of that kind of background. And have done extremely well and made exactly. a real. And, and, and so the question is always, how do we teach kids in the inner city better? How do we break the cycle of poverty? How do we break the cycle of racism? I understand barriers and expectations and all these things. I get it. I, I know there are lots that's it, it's harder. You're in a chaotic environment. There's maybe only one parent in the household. There's too many people in too small a space. There's gunfire outside. There's drugs and temptation all around. You know, I get a lot of the factors but what we don't ever want to talk about is are there different cultural expectations in the poor asian immigrants and the poor hispanic immigrants and the uh you know four five six cycle of uh, other immigrant groups that are stuck in poverty here do some of them have an expectation and to just make it a priority to get educated mm -hmm. any don't they either give up or it's on them or wherever. Um, so Dr. Dr. Grove, you are in charge of the Department of Education. Yes, tomorrow. Tomorrow. What would you change? I would uh, turn down the job. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we've drafted you. You, you got to go. Because... This is I a communitarian project. It's for the greater good. It's not about you. It's about the greater good here. Yeah, I don't believe that the problem is with the Department of Education or anything that the Department of Education can control. The, the problem is in our culture. So I'm sorry to say that ultimately in cultural, in broad cultural terms or broad societal terms, 
the message I have is for those who are concerned about education is not very hopeful. Because it's not money. We got to change our cultural yeah. but, view. But here's the other side of that. For individual families, I believe there are things that can be done. Um, leaving aside the question of whether the household is crowded, and I'm, I'm very aware of that. It's not, but, but for individual families, I do have suggestions in this book, The Drive to Learn. Drive to Learn. About... Uh, in the, you know, the last chapters say, you know, okay, we understand how the East Asians uh, think about education now and so forth. And, and what do they actually do? And what can we do? What can we as a mother and a father do uh, to um, create an atmosphere in the home that value that clearly values education? And I actually end up with giving seven specific suggestions so let me give you one more as we wrap up i want and i know this is another bomb thrower thing here but i i'm a catholic i grew up in uh, catholic schools mm -hmm. and when i finally left the catholic school system we moved around the country and we finally moved it was about fifth or sixth grade uh, i went into public schools for, for for the first time and i remember walking into the class in the middle of the school year and they were taking a test i think it was in english and the teacher said, I, I just want to see where you're at. This isn't going to, don't worry about how you score. Just do mm -hmm. it. I got the top grade in the class. And I won't say it's because I was the smartest kid. Because I this was like, they're teaching sentences and adverbs and adjectives and structure. The nuns pounded the structure into us. And when I came, I was astonished that in fifth or sixth grade, they still don't get the basic structure of language the structure. you know why because they think that kids won't like it and they'll get bored and they, do, they don't want to go into all that detail so we got to we got to make it easy for them we just got to you mm. know kind of slide them into this they don't need all these uh details the about thing. All we used to diagram sentences yeah. crazy and do all this stuff here the structure was what they pounded i into think it. one reason why i love to write books is because i'm old enough that i way back in junior high school i got a really good gr grounding in sentence diagramming and all that stuff mm. and i you know i love to write and frankly i'm quite good at it. so have we uh, in addition to the parents I know you say the problem is within us. Uh, you know, the look in the mirror if you want to understand why kids are the way they are. Right. The expectations and priorities within the family and many times within the culture at, at large. Yeah. But there is also then that reflects in how we teach these kids. Yes. If we don't teach them repetitively, if we don't teach them theory and structure, then how do they really ever understand? I don't know. They do it in other cultures and the kids come out better, but we just don't really want to do it because we put the emphasis on the individual and individual kids said, Oh, do I have to learn this? God, this, this seems so difficult. Boring, and, dry, uh, dull. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, wow. we don't want to drill them. I've, I've heard educators say, absolutely. We will not drive. We will not drill kids in any way, shape or form because it'll drive them away. And so yet we I drill, them drill my own kids at home. You know, my wife and I drill them. We drill them uh, in basketball. We drill them in uh, oh, music. Yeah. Well, but that's important. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I'm, I'm coming away from this kind of sad for education. <laughs> I'm coming away from this conversation saying this is not fixed by money. This no. is not fixed by legislation or laws. No. It's not. Wow. It's that's a reflection why, of who we are. Where's the hope? The hope is at the family and extended family level. Okay. Um, I'll give you one more hope, though. And I wonder, maybe this would be, a, a, a if we ever had you back a third time. We <laughs> could argue, I could argue, that having all, all this set aside, American kids don't score well on tests. We don't get grounded in the basics. We don't get drilled over and over again. So we don't master these subjects or fully understand them. And right. it's all about fun. And we don't force them to do anything that's not fun, et cetera, et cetera, all this stuff. And we don't, and we just sort of accept it's on you and do the best you can and whatnot. However, there is, is there something to be said for that individualism that does let the kid pursue 
their own major, their own course of action, their own thing? Does that create maybe less test results, less basic knowledge, but maybe more imagination and creativity? Well, uh, you know, we were talking a half an hour ago about intrinsic and extrinsic, and we are in the West, we are in America, and it is uh, probably quite accurate to say that intrinsically selected courses of action, uh, courses or whatever, is, uh, tends to be more motivating for children. Uh, we brought it up, I brought it up, because in East Asia, the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic collapses because of the communitarian nature of the family. Huh. Uh, so maybe, maybe it would. Because there's been some criticism why, you know, the Chinese are obviously out to overtake America in, in many ways, shapes, or whatever, whatever, for whatever reason, whatever you call it, they, they don't want to be treated as second class. They want to be seen as equal or greater. And many say, oh my God, Asians pulling so far ahead of us economically, scientifically, technically, and whatnot. And yet right. keeps coming back to, but that creative spark that creates a new thought, uh, the Einsteins of the world, the uh, Googles of the world, the uh, music of the world, that something that takes sort of an imaginative creative spark gets kind of driven out of kids through repetition and book learning and, and drilling them. And you just start following the normal path. So you master that, but you may not be prepared for the future pivots and the future creativity. Does, does creativity get killed by drilling? And would we rather be creative and imaginative and, and create yeah. the world's future? Or do we want kids that are well-grounded, well-trained, well-prepared in the basics? I don't know. Well, one of the things I learned when writing The Drive to Learn is that our definition of creativity is different from the definition of creativity in, in East Asia. Okay, which is and what? So the way they think about creativity, they are, they are that you know they have people who are creative it's quite a different definition it doesn't it doesn't we tend again i think this is a feature of individualism we tend to prioritize the brand new idea that yes. comes out of an individual's head the spark right. the the one right. thought nobody else had pursue that yeah yeah uh, this is you can understand in a communitarian culture that would not be how they would how no, it they tends would to be more it. incremental change it's much I, more I'm, incremental yeah yeah right. i'm gonna i'm gonna take yeah. this and make it a little better rather than a whole new leap of faith into yeah. something that's that's pure research that's pure conjecture that's it, a waste of time let's just make this incrementally better here dr trent is that kind of your understanding of creativity in asia yes and and here's and here's another bomb I'm gonna throw here. Since okay. uh, uh, <laughs> since Paul, Paul's been tossing bombs all morning, I'm gonna That's toss right. my own bomb. <laughs> so, in major industries, in large corporations, usually, and I don't know if this is culture or the, or if this is the the argument of creativity versus being book smart. Right. Usually, the CEO isn't necessarily the A student. They could be the C student. And they're usually a, a C student, American, you know, Caucasian CEO, who hires a whole bunch of, of uh, book engineers smart. and book smart A student Asians. Yeah. So, so are we, by pushing the book smart A student Asians, who are engineers, computer scientists, you know, and they're good employees. Are these folks not trained for that creative C student CEO brain who's at the top? I, I suspect there's some truth to that. So then what do you as think much as Asians say they're accomplishing and moving up, and they certainly are, you know, on a cultural level, they're not moving to the final level because that level requires a different skill. Creativity. It's, it's not Maybe. a unitarian skill of getting along and cooperating and building a team and incrementally making things better based on what you know. And, uh, and a little, it's that wild leap that, that but, Elon Musk brain, that uh, Bill Gates who dropped out of Harvard brain, 
you know. I, I would like to point out that that the way you two are discussing this is an individualistic take on this problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you that. you're looking at it talking about individuals, the individual Asians, the CEO, Bill Gates, uh, so forth and so on. If we were all communitarian, we'd be talking about this in quite a different way. Society. We'd be talking about what the community, what people with different kinds of abilities, uh, all working together, all cooperating, all united in some community sense, are able to accomplish and what individuals are doing would be much less the topic of discussion. Which again goes back to sports, teamwork. It's not about me, it's about the team. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's about uh, the group succeeding, not just whether I succeed and what- But we do pay a lot of attention to the person who's able to throw those touchdown passes. They get a lot of attention. That's oh, yeah. in the conflict in sports. And if you want to argue sports as I do with others, it's that's what's either ruined sports or made sports. When I was a kid, there was no uh, spiking the ball. There was no celebrating. Uh, we lost, but look what I did. You know, I scored the fantastic play, but the team lost. I don't care. Look at my stats. More and more, it's been about individual players, individual stats, the highlights on ESPN. Uh, and as long as I do that, I get my big money, whether the team wins or loses, I don't care. Well, one of the things I discuss in the drive to learn is how Americans and East Asians react quite differently to failure. Oh. I'll and how, uh, and uh, that, that's a cliffhanger. Give us a little brief <laughs> idea on that, then we got to wrap up here. We're over. Go. Well, how do we see failure? Well, how do they see failure? Well, let's let's talk about academic, you know, doing poorly on a test. Um, or, or during, you know, being a B student or, you know, not being at the top. Uh, for many Americans, as we've been discussing here this hour, uh, you know, this is too bad and so forth, but it's not, um, you know, we, we tend uh, in many cases not to talk a lot about failure. We sort of let it go. Right. It's not that we deny it. It's that we just um, don't focus on it. Don't really focus on it. But in Asia, at least in terms of academics, if you do poorly, then there is a lot of attention to that because the what happened that you did poorly on the test or got a poor grade in that, you know, a B in that course means that we, we can diagnose that and we can figure out what wasn't understood and we can drill you in that and mm -hmm. we can make it so that from then on, you're a top student. And that's one of the functions that parents, they, they, they work with the kids to figure out what it is they don't understand. This is a diagnostic procedure and a plan for action about how to correct. So wow. failure gives us in useful information that we can follow up on. So may I suggest then in closing another little bomb thrower thought, uh -oh. this is just an American culture. This is baby boomer culture. Baby yeah. boomer culture is all about me. And it's all about, I don't want to be negative. Don't give me any negative waves, vibes or whatever. So I'm not going to talk about failure or problem. Nobody dies. They just pass away. There is no failure or problem. It's just a challenge. We don't view it as something, we, we minimize all these things. We set them aside, anything that's negative and I don't wanna hear about it and talk about it. Let's right. just move on. Let's not focus on it. I'm never gonna get old. I'm never gonna fail. I'm never gonna die. I don't wanna think about any of these things. And when they were faced with them, we give it some other term. It's not failure. It's, uh, well, they, they, they weren't, uh, it wasn't for them. Yeah, it wasn't for them. Yeah. <laughs> They don't have aptitude in that direction. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's gotta, gotta that. find out what they're good at. Yeah, we dismiss that, we minimize it, we give it some other term. We never call it a failure any more than we call it death or any more than we call it a problem anymore. Companies don't have problems anymore, just challenges. Challenges. Yeah, that's a good yeah. company word. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, well good company discussion here. Fascinating stuff here. I just don't know if we really grasp that the, uh, there was a famous cartoon when I was a kid called Pogo. Yeah. Uh, in, in there, Pogo, the famous line that, that he was always quoted as saying, we have met the enemy and he is us. Right. <laughs> I, have, 
I have quoted that myself and in, in the, my writings. There you now, go. if you ever want to get back with me, there's still we we've, we've spent so much time talking about things that are mainly about this book. Yes, which is about the culture as transmitted by the parents, and we still haven't said a said a whole lot about my more recent book, A Mirror for Americans, which is about what goes on in schools in East Asia, and there's Let's a good it. story to tell there too. Let's do it. I'll uh, I'll look at the dates. I'll send you some dates. Let's do it. Okay. And, and so we are obsessed. Now, do you both have copies of this book? I don't have a copy of that one. I have the copy of the other one. I don't have. I haven't seen a mirror for Americans. Okay. What What about you, Doctor Trin? Yes, you have it. Yes. Okay. It's uh. It, but uh, yeah, let's talk about that book. Um, let's do it in a few weeks, and uh, yeah. there's so much more to talk about, and. And I still want to kind of talk about uh, <laughs> this association between getting great grades and and is it a good thing that your self esteem is tied to it? Is back to this individualism thing, or because I live in both worlds as a, as a child growing up, you know, in a culture that that's all grades and you know academics. I live in this world where yes, we want to strive and get great grades. Do we want to tie our self-esteem to it? Do we want to tie who we are as a person to these grades? I mean, are are Asian kids committing more suicide than American kids because they have bad grades? I don't know the statistics. And is that a good thing or not? And as you There's said so before, before, as you said once before, Dr. Trin, as a good American here now, a child of immigrants. A uh, foot in both worlds. You look at your own kids and you say, I wanted them to succeed, that they're going to college. I'm going to do this, but yet I want them to be well rounded. I want them to well rounded. Be <laughs> but, but you know what's interesting is we, as, as parents, uh, I'm Vietnamese, my wife, Jenny's Chinese. Um, and, and we both were, you know, we're Americanized. Uh, obviously, we grew up here, um, but uh, education is still really at the top it's it's god family and school right it's all the way they're all kind of up there and it's and where i grew up it was god family and sports sports <laughs> <laughs> and, and oh by the way maybe education too yeah. i should have thought yeah. of it <laughs> I do that if that helps but that was where i came from in the heartland of america it was god yeah. family and sports go down to texas and see what they do on a friday night it's god family and sports so, so Paul, are you in touch with my with my uh, publicist? Uh, I, she she can send you a copy of this. All right, I'll have to reach out. I'm sure I can. Teresa, Teresa, uh, uh, ask God. Yes. You know who she is. I do. That's how I'll we let her know that. Place. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll send Teresa some uh, some dates as well. Let's have you come back and let's talk about your uh, second book here. That'd be awesome. Okay. Because we we'll all try hard to keep on this topic and not get off on the other one. Oh, yeah. We all want to find Americans want a quick, easy answer. So give me the money. Give me the answer. What are they doing? We'll imitate it. We'll follow it. Maybe that's the answer for it. <laughs> but if we don't change who we are, we're going to emphasize other things other than education. Yes. Thank you. All right, guys. guys. All right. Take us out, Dr. Trin. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Grove. More, uh, more to come. Our part three to come here. Our, our only guest who's gone uh, through to part three and part two. Uh, and so, uh, so much more. And I'm looking forward to learning more from you. Uh, so God, family, and grades? I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. Thank you. Well, there you have it. If that isn't a healthy discussion, I don't know what is about the health of our kids and the health of ourselves here, the health of our country. Tune in for more here on Health Talks with Dr. Trin, right here in Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net. Streaming live from the University of California, Irvine's Beal Applied Innovation Center. So, Paul, can you still hear me?